So, how do I start? I start by asking myself, where is there an easy value for me to identify? So clearly this is the lowest value in my composition. So it's somewhere around either value one or value 0 0.5 if I mix some black into it. Uh, and the lightest value in my composition is this little area. So we're gonna call that value 10. So everything in between these two, I'm not gonna use value zero and value 10 for anything else because they are reserved for these two spots. So the next lightest value that's available to me is value number nine for this light area. So I think that's where I am going to start. So I'm gonna reach for value number nine and I'm, I'm going with this value range which I have made for my figurative component of the composition. And notice how I'm already expanding my value range beyond what I was able to do in my underpainting. So already it's lighter than what I was able to do before, which is very encouraging because this means that this stage is gonna help me take my painting even farther in terms of my value control. And now right around value nine, I've transitioned to value eight and it would be valuable for you to take a look at my palette as I work on this. So the palette is spotlighted. And if you navigate to speaker view, instead of gallery view, you're gonna lose uh, the sight of me, but the sight of me is not very important. And instead you're gonna only see my palette and you're gonna be able to enlarge it. So I recommend keeping my palette in sight as enlarged as you can. And this would be a good time for questions if there are any. Jonathan, how are we doing on participants? Jonathan? I'm, I'm here, Ken. I'm trying to let people in. Give me one second. No problem. Um, what did you say? Oh, I was asking if there are any questions, but you're busy. Um, Melissa has a question. Melissa, would you mind writing into the chat what your question is? You just utilize that chat option. Uh, can this get to you? Yes, if you have any questions, write them in the chat and we're gonna address all of them. So this, I've already transitioned towards value number six. And I'm trying to create this very fluid gradient by noting when my value becomes darker, which means I need to make a shift. Value number five now. And you can see the numbers, I wrote them on top of my palette, so they're pretty easy to follow. Let me know if it makes sense. They're listed right here, the numbers of these different values. All right, so that's working pretty well. And as I'm doing it, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've changed my drawing a little bit because this is a good opportunity for me to reevaluate whether or not I put everything in the right place in the previous session. And the answer to that is almost always no. There's always room for improvement. So every new layer that you paint should strive for more accuracy than you were able to express in the previous layer. And as you can see, the transition towards the shadow over here, when I need to make it darker, I'm reaching out for value six to make what's going on here a little bit darker. And I'm being very, very attuned 
to the angles. The angles are helping me keep everything measured. See that diagonal over here? It was not so clearly defined the previous time I painted this. But now, since I'm not using solvent anymore, I have so much more control over my paint. So in the underpainting stage, because we're working with transparencies and we're trying to keep our paint really flowy, we were working with very large amounts of solvent. And large amounts of solvent, you know, they're fun for fast and fluid coverage, but they really limit your control. So now by not working with a solvent, I have so much more control over my paint and I'm able to express these uh, geometric properties much more accurately. What I'm dipping into this cup is not solvent, it's a medium. Uh, a medium is different than a solvent because a medium dries on my painting as opposed to dissolving and disappearing from the surface of my painting. Uh, and we're gonna go over that difference in more detail next lesson when we talk about the glazing process, which will depend very, very heavily on an understanding of what a medium is. So we're reaching out for value seven over here. And you notice this is, this is very, very different. I don't know if Melissa, if you were here last time, but it's very, very different from the way that we worked on the underpainting because in the underpainting, again, all these different variations, we could express them a little bit, but we couldn't express them as well as we can express them now. And in order to express all these variations, we had to fight so hard with the transparency and the explosiveness of the solvent, when right now, when I want to create something, you know, lighter or darker, all that it means is that I'm moving either to the right or to the left of my palette. All my options are pre-mixed. So it's helping me get this done more accurately and quickly. So it's really a fantastic, fantastic way to work. And as I'm working on this, I want you to know this, that I'm paying very close attention to what's going on in the edges. You know, I don't want to make the meeting point between values too sharp. You know, this is the point in the process where it's very important to start characterizing these meeting points appropriately. So I'm going to actually switch because the brush that I was using was uh, a little too stiff for my taste for this part of the process. I'm gonna start using a softer one and I think that's gonna really help. Oops, got to paint on myself, trying not to do that. So that's a softer brush. And in my other hand, I'm always holding a rag so that I can modulate and control the amount of paint that's constantly on my brush. Because it's very important to become sensitive to how much paint is actually on your brush. Sometimes you need a lot of paint, sometimes you need a small amount of paint. This is all part of our painterly responsibilities. And uh, I think we can uh, maybe enable audio. What do you think, Jonathan? Maybe me and Melissa will have a conversation about this. Making the nose a little larger, improving the state of the design. So every move that I was making last time is now being scrutinized, readdressed, 
reassess and improved. Nothing from the previous stages should ever limit you from making further corrections and further improvements. You're always pushing, pushing, pushing your work forward. Very, very important. And notice how this opening of the value range is so significant. Everything starts to really, really shine. And it really helps us start to create this sense of the structure, you know, really building the three dimensionality. This stage is the best, best, best moment to construct your three dimensionality in, in full form. Because really when you're working with a, with a palette like that, that is only allowing you to control values, values are the, the primary control unit of three dimensionality and form. So you can be fully focused on exactly that. I don't need to worry too much about color right now because I don't really have color so much on my palette. So I can really focus on what I do have. And when I do have value, that means I can really create structure that works optimally. And this is a really, really great stage to focus on that. And now I'm going to finally get into those shadows that I was concerned with and eliminate that transparency, which is not going to serve me well in my next moves. So I'm going to get rid of it. So what value should I reach for? I'm going to try value four. Let's see how that works. Not too bad, I think that's a good decision. See what I'm doing? I'm applying an opaque value to where there was a transparent value. It's staying the same value, but I'm putting down an opaque layer. And this is gonna provide me with such an excellent foundation for the glazing stage later, that it's gonna be so, so, so fun to work on it. On the top here, I'm going to go to value five because there's this little reflection over here. All these little details that I could not address in the underpainting can now be addressed because now I have a much more sophisticated organization of materials at my disposal, which allows me to really express much more subtle things. This shadow under the hair. Really beautiful stuff going on here in the original painting. Let's get that transition to work. And this brush is working much better than the previous brush, so I'm happy I made the switch. I was working with a bristle brush, and now I'm working with a synthetic brush, which is softer. But if I tried to work with a synthetic brush last time, forget about it. That would not have worked at all. It would have been way, way, way too soft for what we were trying to do last time. All right, now the inner part of the shadow is where things get a little bit darker. So we're gonna shift from value four to value two, maybe three, and see how that looks. Maybe three.
Jonathan, you with me? I want to expand this shape a little bit. And then if it gets expanded too much, I can later on bring the background and bite back into it. Let me get some of that eye in there. I dip into some black because that's a lot darker. And just to let you know that if you're interested in different kinds of lessons where I'm able to watch you paint and give you individual feedback, I do teach privately and I'll be happy to work with you. So if you're interested in that, just go to kengoshen.com lessons and submit a form and I'll be responding shortly. In that format, both me and my students are able to paint simultaneously. I look at what they're doing and I watch them like a hawk to make sure that all the moves that they make are the optimal moves for the painting that they're working on. All right, so this is moving along nicely. Jonathan, you with me? Okay, since I don't hear from Jonathan, I might want to check what's going on in the chat. So I'm going to pause one second. Let's see what's going on here. Chat. All right, so turn around and see the questions piling up. Yeah, my moderator is not here. Sorry, people, I'm trying to work this out. So, what color? Da -da -da. Okay, so the reason that I couldn't address the details in the underpainting is because of two, two reasons. One, the value range that's available to me in the underpainting is way, way, way more limited because I'm not able, you've seen, as soon as I put that light in there, the whole painting just exploded with light. And you're gonna see, for example, if I just, to show you what I mean, if I just take dark value and put it right there, See how dark that looks? So my, my value range is much more limited when I'm working on the underpainting. And hence, when the value range is condensed, you're, you're way less able to, to express all these different nuances because you just don't have the values to express it. That's one reason. The second reason is because um, when you're using so much solvent in order to make sure that you can move things quickly and that you can erase, that solvent causes the paint to behave very chaotically. So it's like very flowy and running all over the place, which is awesome for when you're trying to get your composition to be correct and, and, and do it quickly, but it makes it impossible for you to make any refined decision because everything is flying all over the place. Does that make sense? And for the people who ask whether or not this is still grisaille, so in the grisaille, what made you decide whether to make your light areas a light opaque or a transparent? Well, 
I am trying to make everything relatively opaque because later when I glaze on top of it, anything that's left too transparent is not going to receive the glaze in a beautiful way. It's going to be actually a bummer. So right now, this area may be more textured than this area, but both of them are sufficiently opaque so as to enable my glaze to work. Why don't you have the value range in the underpainting? Can you please say why you did in Grisai? Can you please unmute me? All right, Melissa, listen, there's a lot of people here now and I'm gonna unmute all of you. So please try to be respectful and we'll have a conversation. I wish my moderator was here with me, but they're not. So let's try to do this in a nice way. So everybody's on right now and we're gonna talk through this. Okay. All right, ask me, let's roll. I'm not trying to be impatient. I was a little frustrated because I, I kind of under, I just need to clarify. No and, problem, trust me. I also I wish my moderator was here. Don't worry don't about it, we're gonna make can. it work. I All right, um, I, I, Talk I, to I, me. I do paint, I studied Monsell, so I do understand, um, you don't have to explain a lot, but I would okay. like to know. I can explain a lot, I'm happy to explain a lot. All right, well, I missed, unfortunately, I didn't know you even existed. I missed the prior classes, but with mm -hmm. an underpainting, which I know is a grisaille. I never really worked that way with, you know, glazing and opaque colors. I know what you're saying. When you do the grisaille, you're using, a, you're using um, different values, but you're using them, is it, are you using them transparently in your underpainting? I mean, so, now I know so, you're matching value with opaque color. I yes, guess. So, so the underpainting and the grisaille are different exactly in that regard. The underpainting, in the underpainting stage, the way that I modulate my values is by making my colors more opaque or less, uh, sorry, more or less transparent. So if I'm just working with, a, with an umber pigment and I wanna make it, uh, make something lighter, what I would need to create is a transparency in my umber okay. so as to apply less umber to my surface. Right okay, now, great. I understand that. So when you were saying in the beginning, you said, I, I think you said, in the beginning, you're going to, in your underpainting, you apply less, you can either apply less pigment to make it lighter or a transparent pigment uh, to make it lighter. Is that correct? In, in the underpainting, both yes. of these would be the same thing, right? Because when I'm applying something transparently in the underpainting, what in fact I'm doing is since I'm thinning it out with solvent, a yeah. solvent would essentially evaporate from my painting Hence, creating a scenario in which I have applied less pigment to my okay. surface. So, so we are not, the same thing. So you're not using any white in your light areas in the grisaille? In the grisaille or in the underpainting? In, in, bo in both of them, I am. In both of I them, I am. The grisaille, I thought you said the grisaille was the underpainting. No, so the grisaille, let me try, let me try, to, let me try to redo this. So the grisaille is what we're doing right now. Oh, I see. So what we're doing right now is different from the underpainting in that the vast majority of our value control is happening on the palette instead of on the surface of the I painting. See. Right now, because when I was working on the underpainting, I didn't have all this variety uh, available to me. And, and therefore, I had to create transparency in order to, to control my values. But now, I no longer have to do that and I can use transparency however I want. This is okay. because I consider the grisaille to be the first step of the painting proper, while the underpainting is still more related to drawing. Okay, so then um, in your, when you're doing your grisaille, mm -hmm. are you using the same value, you're the same hues, you're using the neutral gray and the umber strings, correct? And you're just thinning them with solvent the, the, to get your the, values? The no? same, the, oh, let's slow down. So, um, and thank you for being patient. We're, we're, we're working it out. It's, uh, I really appreciate it. So okay. the thing is, when you're saying hues, are you referring to pigments? I mean pigment, yes. yes. So yes, I am working with the exact same pigments. And on my palette right now, I have mixed those two strains of values from the, the warmer one that I'm using now for uh, rendering the face is only mixed with white and burnt umber, while the other one is mixed with white and on the other edge there's raw umber mixed with some black to make it even more neutral. 
So I've created this neutral strain by mixing black and raw umber and this warmer strain by just using burnt umber and white. Wait, well, the neutral is black and raw umber and the other one is the brown is what? Uh, burnt umber, uh, raw umber and white? Raw, um, raw umber and black on the, on the dark end yeah. right here. This is raw umber and black. And on the other hand is just white. And the brown string is what? Burnt umber. Oh, burnt umber. Burnt umber, pure, pure burnt umber, uh, all the way up to white. Yes. Okay. And now, so see, when I'm working on the hair, I've started incorporating the more neutral, the more neutral uh, value strain because I want to create differentiation between the warm hues that we're seeing in the face in the more neutral scenarios that are happening in the hair. So I've started tapping into my second strain of values. So um, let me ask, so you did the gris, um, the, so the underpainting was done prior to this class. Right. And you made your values with using the Trans same hair. strings we just discussed, no. but- No, 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 not the same strings. As I said, it was the same pigments but I did not mix them in advance on the palette, but rather I mixed them on the surface uh, by applying solvent to them. So it's a very, very different approach. Very different approach. Uh, you can, and I'll be happy to, uh, point you to the video of the previous recorded okay. lesson. And uh, I think that's going to clarify it much more uh, because, uh, you know, videos speak louder than words. Yes. Uh, but yes, that, that, that was a very, very different approach. And it, and it differed in that my values here that you see on the palette, there was none of it. It was just three pigments, raw umber, burnt umber, white. And nothing was mixed with a palette knife in advance at all. Everything was oh. here on the painting. So you did use white in your yes, underpainting? Yes, in your underpainting. Certainly. Okay. certainly use white. Yes. It's uh, um, I can actually go into a little bit of a, a little bit of an explanation about that too, because there's a whole um, there's a whole uh, train of thought that you shouldn't be using white in your underpainting, and that is definitely correct if you're planning to paint that painting in the same day, because if you had white in your underpainting and you're trying to paint directly on top of it now then the white is going to really interfere with everything you're trying to do. Uh, but if you have time to let your, to let your underpainting dry, there's really no reason not to use white in there. It only helps you expand your value range significantly. And the old masters did that a lot. So I do that a lot. I just do my underpainting on a different day from the day when I plan to continue my painting. And that really helps me. Now, what I'm noticing is so now you're I tried to unmute everybody, but I've only unmuted you, so I'm going to be fair and unmute okay, the other people do. too. And we're going to all have a nice conversation if you want to, people. This is different than what I usually do, but we're going to roll with it. Where? Why? Okay, I'm trying to unmute you, but it won't let me. I don't know why. You need your moderator. <laughs> ah, I really do. Really, really do. All right, so... Didi, you're unmuted, and Susan, I tried to unmute you, but I, I uh, for some reason, it's not working for me. She looks like she's unmuted. Oh, I good. Unmuted. All right. Hey, everyone. It's a party now. <laughs> I All just, of us are talking. Woohoo! I'm Super such fun. a beginner that I'm just drinking it all in. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. This is like uh, more disorganized than I would want it to be. No, I'm uh, so much better I'm than I was. I'm doing my best under know. the circumstances. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm going to try to stay a little bit after to make sure things are clear. But to be honest, I have another lesson with someone from Australia <laughs> later on. So I got to kind of fly to that lesson too. But uh, please, like, go on my website and you know, get on my list so that you can always be updated with all my different lessons. Like, I really, really appreciate you signing up. It's, it's, uh, 
It's always better with a moderator, but we're going to have a more... No, we could, we could, if we wanted, at some point take a private with you. Oh, yeah. I teach mostly privately. So what I, what I do is uh, the majority of the time I teach private lessons. I do these group lessons with CCS, and I also do my own group lessons that happen on Tuesdays. So you can definitely sign up for that, too. And yes, I teach privately, and that's very, very different because when I teach privately, I'm able to see everything that you do and really tell you exactly how to, you know, get everything done step by step, which is, you know, very, very different from this kind of lecture format. Uh, and, you know, every, every part, you know, every kind of, uh, oh, who's drawing on my uh, stuff? Me! How come? Could you stop? <laughs> I don't know how I did that. Oh, no. I was so sorry. How come? It's okay. I don't know. This is all strange. Strange occurrences. Uh, what I'm am I going to do? Oh, here. It. Is it gone? It's not gone. No. Why would, why would I have any effect over your screen? Very peculiar. Uh, let me just redo this share. I think that might do this. Let's try. Oh, Jesus. So oh, sorry. man. <laughs> sorry about that. This is people. terrible. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Don't worry about it. We're gonna try again. Screen oh share. God. Don't worry about it. This is a little bit of a bumpy ride, but we're all patiently accepting the technological suboptimal nature. And there we go, we're back, so. God, I don't know, I don't wanna to touch my screen. <laughs> if we could try not to draw on the screen, that'd be greatly appreciated. I, uh, I'm not trying to, I don't know. No, 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 I'm I know, I know, I'm just, I'm just joking. Because we're, ha we're having a, we're having a. Oh, you know why? Because I have a little thing in my, my screen on my iPad. It said Ken's screen with a little pencil. Yeah, so I guess. That, you should probably disable that at some point unless you want. Yeah, I have a lot on my plate. <laughs> so, no, I know. Yeah. I mean, moderate. I mean, yeah. yeah. Not you, but whomever manages. Whomever, it. yeah. I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's supposed to be by default disabled. But um, now. I know. Not really it's frustrating. So. Ken, do you have the painting that you're, you're, you're drawing from? Can we see that? So the... Oh, that would be a perfect thing for Jonathan to put in the chat. <laughs> uh, is this a, is, Ken, is this a, a paint? Did you transfer your pencil drawing to your canvas? No, I painted the, the first lesson. I actually just painted this in charcoal. So directly. So you started from, your drawing right started on. Started my drawing with an empty page. This is what happened two weeks ago. It was an empty page that we just, I can send you all the pre previous videos so that you can see how this whole thing started. They're all available on my Patreon and signing up there is just $2 and you can see all those previous videos. And uh, I'll tell you that the technological things that happened there were far smoother. So hopefully. What is Patreon? I've been hearing a lot about that. So Patreon is a way for people to support creators uh, mm -hmm. where you can just decide that you're pledging uh, a certain number of dollars, for example, $2 or something like that. And in return, the artist provides behind the scenes content that's not available anywhere else. So in my case, okay. pre -rec like lessons and stuff like that, things that already happened, people want to go back and watch them. So it's a, it's a modest $2 amount, which, you know, hopefully adds up and helps me. And then you get to watch over 30 hours of content uh, which is good for you, so everybody wins. Let's see now. So I'm noticing that now, since I redid my screen share, it's uh, gratifyingly happening in delay. Is it two dollars a month or one time? You can, you can. Uh, technically, it's it's a month, but you can just pay it one time, watch everything, and then disconnect from it. So there's nothing to there's nothing to there's no commitment in any way. Um, so you said you drew right on your canvas with yeah. uh, charcoal. It's canvas, and then actually, it's paper. Paper, and then did you fix it? Nope, I just went into it with, uh, with paint without fixing it. I don't, I didn't feel the need to fix it because uh, I actually prefer to have the opportunity to make my drawing better whenever I get back to it. So I like the fact that when I go back to my drawing, it kind of scatters all over the place and disappears. And is your paper gessoed? No, it arrives ready to paint. 
It's uh, it's by uh, what's that company called? Arch. It's I mean, canvas paper. No, it's just oil painting paper, pure oh. pure cotton paper that's oh. made for oil painting, and uh, it's really convenient. I I enjoy it a lot. Never heard of it. I always just use canvas paper. Yeah, canvas paper is a little lame. It doesn't really deliver. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> that's what I never use. Yeah, it's not really not the best. So this is called oil painting paper. Yes. By, it's by a company called Arch, which is spelled Archev. Uh, A-R-C-H, like the, paint, the paper company? That's exactly it. Yes, the paper company. They make oil painting paper as well. Because they, they make watercolor paper, but they never yeah, do. Make. They make a lot of kinds of awesome paper. OK, they, cool. They definitely deliver. So I, I, I do like their paper because it just comes in ready to paint. I don't have to think about gessoing it and all that kind of stuff because I have a million lessons going on. And then I just need some paper that I can just snag. It's going to be ready. And you know, I don't so Ken, you're not about. using you're not using solvent at all in this in this phase. No, I'm not using solvent for any purpose that is not cleaning my brush. The reason again is because since I'm planning to glaze this next week, uh, I don't want any transparent areas uh, since it's going to interfere with my ability to create high chroma areas in my glazing. So just thinking ahead uh, on my process, I. Uh, I'm trying to purposefully avoid making things uh, transparent when I don't want to. And if I, and if I want to make, like for example, here when I'm trying to extend my paint, you know, and I do end up making it transparent, I prefer to do it with a medium and not with a solvent because the medium is going to create a different film from the solvent. It's, the, it's a film that's much more uniform and responds uh, much more positively to the to the effects of glazing that are going to happen to it later. So you oh so you are using a medium in this. Yeah, a medium, yes, just not a solvent. A medium and a solvent are very very different things. Yeah, right. Let, let me, no, 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 no worries, no worries. Let me just. That's a great question, actually. I'm gonna. So are you using linseed or walnut or what? No, I'm using? using a resin called Galkid Slow Dry. I I don't like using oil so much because. It just never dries and stays sticky and is super annoying. I really much prefer to use uh, resins. And the difference between a solvent and a medium, uh, it's a good thing you bring it up, is that a solvent evaporates from the surface of my painting and doesn't stay in it. While a medium, if you just pour it on, it hardens and becomes a permanent fixture of your painting. So it actually creates a very, very different visual effect. So for example, you see here, here I used a lot, uh, this is all happening in the lake. Ah, these screen shares. Um, so in the bottom of the beard, I used a lot of medium, but you don't see it uh, looking like broken and shattered like the paint looks in the background, right? The paint in the background looks all broken up. It's that broken up effect that is created by the solvent. That's the visual effect that a solvent has. And so your first layer is you can use is the underpainting and you yeah and the underpainting I use a ton of solvent absolutely hundred percent and then that's your, in first, this, that's your first layer then the underpainting we missed that but uh, unless you count the charcoal drawing okay which, which happened before that but yes it would be a charcoal drawing followed by an underpainting followed by a grisaille and next week is going to be the color color extravaganza which uh, everybody's waiting for, except for Jonathan, who isn't here, uh, because he collapsed. I don't know what happened, but it's a bummer. <laughs> and again, I, I apologize. This is a, uh, I'm working with CCS and I'm, I'm really happy to be working with them, but that means I like have no control over the logistics. I just show up and paint uh, and, uh, they didn't give me a link to get the, a link that worked either. So you had a. Oh, you're that, kidding. No, I had, I contacted him like around four o'clock and I said the, the zoom link that you had, you know, where you hit click meeting now, uh -huh. it, it didn't work. <gasps> it said, it said the host has another meeting going on. Oh, so maybe that's my. where your people are. Oh, you're kidding me. Oh he my needs to God. Do a little better job to support you you know what I mean because you might be missing people I'm, I'm for sure missing people 
<laughs> this is like a very unlikely because I know that you know people do sign up. Uh, so that's uh. Mm -hmm. Well, well, there's only so much I can worry about at any given moment. But thank you for exactly. providing me that feedback. I really, really do appreciate it. And again, yeah, he just had to send me a link at the mat last minute. He sent me another email invite. I see. Okay, well, definitely. Just so you I, know. Once I finish teaching in Australia, <laughs> I'm going to have a little talk and we'll see how we can make things better next time. Okay. But thank you for sticking around. Uh, through thick and thin, I, uh, I'm really uh, happy that you are, because otherwise I'd be painting this alone. So it's a good thing that you found your way to this meeting. <laughs> so again, in the underpainting, you either apply less pigment or more um, pigment. solvent, or more solvent. No, they're the same thing, because less pigment means more solvent, right? Okay. How do you reduce the amount of pigment? Let's say I try to cover an area. How do I make sure that that area is covered with less pigment? I apply a lot of solvent to it, then the solvent evaporates, and what remains on my surface is less pigment. Okay, so you either use less solvent. Right. Or what? Or, and, or but you, I have or transparent pigment. Well, the transparency and the amount of, of the pigment that gets applied to the surface and the, oops, pardon me, that's not good. Um, you have to, okay, so it's not like you have so many options. These options are the same option. When I make something transparent in my underpainting, I made it transparent by using solvent. And when I make something transparent by using solvent, I made the area more uh, contain less pigment because the solvent has caused a scenario in which I have less pigments on my surface. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, perfect. We've got it. And so I meant to say, I guess you could make less a higher value, a higher, a lighter value by using less pigment or more solvent or um, using more white, is that right? 100% correct, bingo. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna use a bigger brush because I don't wanna run out of time and miss my next lesson, but I also wanna stay with you a little bit longer. So we're gonna try to get everything done and I'm gonna try to speed up a little bit because I can get carried away with the, in having too much fun. But I don't want to get this to be incomplete. That would be a bummer. You're not working from dark to light, I notice. Uh, no. Is there a reason why I should? No, I just was taught that so many years ago. <laughs> hmm. What's the rationale? Uh, I don't know. Well, don't let me, uh, let me be diplomatic about this. Uh, a lot of people, when they teach you stuff and they don't tell you why, I do highly recommend asking why, because I've heard some preposterous advice given over the years that uh, would make your ears bleed. So I'm open to being wrong about this, but I would love the rationale. I don't know. It was a, it was an atelier. He had us always, uh, you know, start with the drawing, like so. You had separated your darks from your lights, and when you went in to start painting, and this he taught Monsell. When you started mm -hmm. painting, you would start with your uh, mid-tone shadow, and then start with the lightest lights to your middle lights to your dark lights to your half tones, like that, and then that was a, and then into the shadows and the reflected light. Okay, uh, the thing about the Atelier is mm -hmm. that it's a great system for making everybody uh, sufficiently proficient at something, but also to paint the same. Uh, it would be crazy to think that if Bougaro painted this way, then Rembrandt painted that way too, you know? There's yeah. many, many ways to create uh, very striking outcomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 
you know, I definitely agree that painting that way arrives at a certain result, but whether or not that result is for some reason better or, or, or less so than another result, I, I am not sure. Okay. Because you, when you look, when you look at what you said, you know, you do see a lot of paintings that look like that in um, 19th century France, but you definitely don't see that in Dutch Baroque. So it really uh, does depend on the kind of painting you're trying to make. If you're trying to make something that looks a certain way and you know how to get there, then fantastic. Uh, but I haven't really, uh, I, the way that I studied painting, I wasn't really instructed to limit myself in any of those ways. As long as you hit your values, as long as you get your drawing accurate, as long as you're very um, calculated and, and, and uh, meticulous with regard to your process, then the order in which you do things, as long as it has a good reason, then that's great. Okay. And right now, I mean, since all my, my pigments are pre-mixed on my palette, uh, I don't really see why it would matter which one I put first. I put first the ones that, um, how to explain it. So light falls over shadow, right? And if I start with the light and pull my lights towards my shadows, it's a very natural turn of event because it creates these edges and these flows around my painting that feel very natural to the way uh, that light behaves in my field of vision. So I'm very tempted to work that way. Uh, and I often do. But you also did have your darks already on there with your underpainting. Absolutely. If I didn't have my darks there, then there would be nothing yeah. more important than putting those dark in right away. Of course, a hundred percent. So you're underpainting, you're using black, raw, umber, and white, mixing it directly with solvent on your, on your paper. Uh, I, uh, that would be 100% correct, except for when you said mixing. Uh, I would say mixed, because I did it in this painting, but it's definitely not what I always do. I change it around a lot, depending on the kind of painting that I'm working on. It fits perfectly into the color scheme of this specific painting, but if the color scheme was different, then my underpainting would be different. I'm very right, but I mean, you're, you're, I should say, to, to my you're putting it yeah. directly, those were the three colors you're using in this case, black, raw, hundred percent, yes, yes, that is, per that is perfectly correct. Perfectly correct. All right, so we're making progress here. We're gonna make sure that we make this happen. All right, so now this bottom over here is gonna be down this way. And uh, Susan, are you still with us? No? She's, she's there, she's muted, Ken. Ah, I see, I see. All right. Just as long as we're having a, an audio party, I want to make sure that people are included if they wish to be. Yeah. All right, so that's working kind of nicely. Now the back of the head, we're going to make that warmer, of course. You don't want to leave that to be totally gray. Any other questions, Melissa? Thank you for uh, for all this <laughs> chat. No, it's great. I'm just trying to get my notes straight because everybody uh, teaches a little differently. Do you do Mansell when you move on? Or of no? course, Mansell is my name. Mansell is my favorite guy on earth. I would love. Where to did Where did you study, Kim? Where did you go to school? 
I studied at an atelier, not really an atelier, but a classical painting program in Tel Aviv. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was awesome, and I loved every moment of it. And uh, the Israeli uh, figurative scene is a little bit different from the American or the French or the Italian. So we, we do things a tad bit differently, which uh, might be why you're uh, seeing these things that perhaps uh, are, <laughs> are slightly different, but uh, it's okay, you know, every, every tradition has its own quirks. Mm. All right, so now this was fun. Let me just get this dark under the eye a little bit more visible. Yeah. Now, for the light of the eye, of course, I'm going with my neutral value. This area, I still don't want to go into too much detail. I still think I can do a better job when all of this mess dries. But what I really want to do is get a big brush and cover the rest of the stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. For longer videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash kengoshen. For lessons, please visit my website at kengoshen.com slash lessons. See you next time.